This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the March 2nd edition of the SIG Network meeting. Uh, we do not, uh, just a reminder that this meeting is under the Kubernetes Code of Conduct, which essentially boils down to please be nice to one another. We don't have a whole lot on the agenda for today. We just have triage and grooming. So if you do have an item, um, take a couple seconds, put it on there while we're talking, and we can get to it. Otherwise, we'll just go over triage. All right. All right. So we'll get started from the top of the list here. Um, is it still necessary to maintain the limitation on exposing port 10 to 50 externally? So this one I've read, it seems like the answer is maybe it's fine now. Somebody needs to put in a cap. Uh, we haven't accepted it. Looks like Dan just mentioned something on it. Does anybody? Yeah, that was, I, that was in response to the question about cube proxy above that I think Tim put in. Um, and as far as I know, it still listens by default on 10256 only for uh, GCP internal load balance or health checks. So the the cube proxy. So there's the the original history of this was um, providers, and honestly, I forget which all of them it was. Um, I know Google was included in the list, but I don't know who else. Um, where the load balancer could inadvertently take uh, if I created a service, an external service on port ten two fifty, it would be possible to access the kubelet on the internet. Um, and the problem is the kubelet API is actually really powerful. It's not just a read-only API. It can do a bunch of stuff. Um, and so we threw that limitation in um, with a note to come back and check on it once all the load balancer implementations were fixed. Clearly, we forgot to come back and check on it. Um, I don't know for sure if all of them are fixed. I don't know that because I don't think we ever enumerated them all. I mean, there's no such thing as all anymore, right? At, at some point we had in-tree providers and we could say, are all the in-tree providers done? We could still use that, but it's sort of a less um, less weighty assertion now that the in-tree providers, because we know that they're not all of them. Um, so, and, and Jordan's point was the, in some cases the default for Kubelet is not authorized. So it would still be wide open. So the, the impact of getting this wrong is pretty high. Um, I'm honestly not sure how to proceed. I would love to get rid of this little old wart in here. Um, but Do I don't want to make it a big opt-in flag yeah. if we can avoid it. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry. Uh, I, I get I get the sense in getting rid of this old wart. I am a little curious, like it doesn't, I'm not seeing like what the drive for this was. It almost feels like something that he just, maybe this person stumbled upon and just kind of thought like, ah, that shouldn't be like that anymore. It'd be nice to know if there was like a driving cause behind this. Cause I could see this getting stuck in the swamp for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is the intent here to actually, cause he's, the reporter is using cube cuddle expose is the intent there to actually expose all of the kubelet ports externally? Yeah, that's that's part of my question. Is like, yeah. what, what what are we actually trying to do? Because I get that maybe you don't want to have this limitation, but it would be nice to at least know why. Uh, uh, especially as it's going to be expensive to fix this. Go ahead. Has another, yeah, kubelet has another authentication, authenticated port. That it, it is a uh, there is something to migrate for that. Not sure if I understood exactly what you're saying, but as far as like the authentication. The, the, the kubelet has two parts, one unauthenticated, another authenticated. Um, if I Un understood this comment correctly, then under certain conditions, that is true, but not under all conditions. So like there's some backwards compatibility behavior that we have if you run the kubelet via command line. But if you run it via config file, it actually has a safe configuration by default, which is interesting. Well, also, what 
like keep cuddle exposed just creates a new service right why would you want to in the reporter's example at the top i don't understand why you would want to create a service that backs all of your like a load balancer service that has all of your cubelets as backends that's well these are the virtual cubelets so they're it's it's different okay. like you could be running virtual cubelet as a pod inside a cluster right but would you well, not in want, this like, case it won't be yeah it sorry man no, in I this just case gonna, it won't be yeah, node ip yeah 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 it, it, i'm just saying in this case it wouldn't be public node ip yeah the the old the old bug was an issue where the load balancer would let traffic through, um, but when it arrived at the VM, we couldn't tell that the far the firewall couldn't tell the difference between traffic bound for the VM and traffic bound for the load balancer, and so it would allow it through, and so that port was effectively on the internet. And the, the, I guess the question is, is there any path forward where we just say YOLO, like we're, we're taking this out uh, <laughs> or, or do we make it a flag? Like, do we add it to API server and say dash dash allow service 10 to 50 and tell providers, if you know your provider is safe, you should go and enable this because here. So, uh, but is the intent of that kubectl expose though to use the service as a node port service? Because it would make zero sense to me to have a cluster, I you know, to have the cluster IP for all of your kubelets, because then you'd never know which one you were going to get. I I kind of ag I agree with you, right? So maybe the the use case in question here is dubious. Um, that's actually a great point. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I can see the node part kind of my argument point because I know that that's be what the yeah, use case is. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I I know that there is a use case for having the node port service there. I've heard of that with virtual machines that are running as pods in the cluster. Um, so, like, I know that's a use case, and this doesn't seem that far off of it, but. Um, it just seems a little maybe overly broad as stated originally. So I, basically, maybe there is a valid use case in here for that, um, but it's just not clear to me if that's the intent of the reporter or not. Roger that. In the interest of time, time, if everybody's okay with it, I'd be happy to just assign myself this one to triage it further, looking to get more information from the original author. And sure, I'd be starting a couple of... There. I captured a couple of thoughts here, so I'll, I'll post those. But if you want to dig into it further, like, please, uh, we can entertain it. If ultimately, if, if it's really important that we enable this, uh, I'm not going to stand in the way of a flag or something. Um, it's just unfortunate. So, so, I, I, I also think that, like, what's the use case? Yeah. It's well, one well, of those well, things. Well, that, let's, yeah. let's figure well, it out. It's safer to uh, keep uh, closed. Uh, yeah. And then one, one question. Did make... uh, Go ahead, Antonio. Sorry, I'm getting. Yeah, some one lag. question. So the thing is, the kubelet has a secure port and an unsecure port, and this is the read only port is the unsecure one, right? Why they don't use the other one? We can. Well, ask. I mean, <laughs> we whether we agree with the originally cited use case, the fact that we have this magic port that you can't use and it's only buried somewhere down in the implementation is kind of horrible, right? Okay, okay, that's, okay, why? Okay, I was thinking that the, that's the problem. Per? Yeah, so <clears throat> too small. I mean, aren't there more ports that should be protected and it should be a mechanism to inform the load balance of which ports it shouldn't be able to use? That's one side of it. The matter is that I checked in the analyst for uh, ports and port 1250 is actually not assigned for uh, 12, 12250 is not assigned to anyone so we should probably register this port and if it's that uh, sort of important at the honor um, yeah we we could uh, I don't know why we didn't that, do that that's before. more just courtesy right so people know what it is makes no big difference I, I can would you mind throwing a comment on this uh, issue just to that effect real quick yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put the comment and I can look into it. I know you guys are. Thank you. Okay. 
I'm going to follow up with them. I do agree with Tim's call out that like, uh, we should probably make this a cap so that we're taking the time to make sure we don't YOLO it. <laughs> Cause it's just, it's, it's kind of seems like a, no, there be dragons kind of situation. Anything else to say about this one or should we move on to the next? Move on. Panic threshold for readiness probe failures. When using external dependencies inside health checks or using fixed thread pool applications like Python and Gunicorn, Ruby and Passenger, PHP, etc., upstream service failures tend to cause cascading impact on the service as well. I haven't read this one yet, so if you, if you don't want me to just read it out loud, let me know. But uh, I, can I can summarize it. OK, thank you. So the, the, he has an application, and he has several endpoints. And he said that when something is terrible wrong, just don't don't make use of the readiness prof. Just send traffic anyway to a certain percent. I see. And he said that's something that uh, thing you commented there. I think that just correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, OK. And I don't know, he said that Tenboy implement that. And what I said is, well, you can do your own thing using the this readiness thing and implement your own uh, logic. Uh, but I don't think that you can change the current Kubernetes logic to implement this. I mean, it's very risky. Yeah, I've seen this before um, in in a couple of other places where like, the load balancer just says, uh, things look like they're going to hell. I'm just going to spray to everybody. Or things like they're going to hell, let me flip to a different backend service that returns really cheap 404s instead, right? Or not 404s, but 503s or something instead, right? But one um, question before, before you move it. With that case, is the health check of the load balancer, right? I mean, I, I mean, but, but, I, I, go ahead. That, that's the key um, here: is who who is the the source of truth? If if that is the case with load balancer health check, then maybe the health check is not. I mean, has a partial view. He doesn't. <laughs> but this is the the health check is the cumulative to the pod and to the probe itself. Sorry, I lost the thread there. Yeah, yeah. so the thing is, you, you have a load balancer and you have an yeah. endpoint, OK? And you need readiness. The way that load balancer implements this uh, readiness, usually they help check directly from whatever the outside the team. But in Kubernetes, this is not the case. It's the readiness is the, the one that you configure in the, in the pod, and is the one that we propagate with endpoint, right? Right. So that's why I think that the same model doesn't apply because it's it's not one to one. So I think there's a, a few different things that this pattern mitigates. One is our health checkers are unreliable and we don't believe what they're telling us. Um, the other is uh, things are going to hell. Everybody's overloaded. Better to spray the traffic around and try to serve it than not. Right, which I'm not sure I buy, but but I, I see why people could get there. Um, the way I interpreted, so I, I I linked this back to another issue, right, which is the the backup selector. Um, the way I understood the backup selector, the real value is not we don't trust our health checking. It's something is really going wrong with this service. Let me send traffic to an alternate service instead, not to do the same job but to give a lower cost error answer. Like when you go to GitHub and you get the unicorn, right? Like that's coming from a different backend than the regular Git servers, right? Because their load balancer was like, ah, crap, something's wrong. Send them to the error page. Yeah, but well, we don't publish the point. How do you do that? We, uh, sorry, what do you yeah. mean? The pod is the health check page. The pod goes and ready. Yes. Uh, we, what we do? We don't remove the pod from the point or we do? 
we, we mark it not ready in the endpoint stuff, right. right? Right, right, right. So I, I think I, I interpret this request as some threshold below which we send traffic to uh, a different set of backends instead, right? So it, if I have 10 services and only one of them is actually re reporting ready at the moment, just send them to the unicorn and let the unicorn deal with it versus trying to overload that one. And then when the rest recover, say we get back to 30%, then they come back. You, you just said services, Tim. Did you mean pods or did you actually mean services? Uh, I Well, uh, a backup selector. So, I mean, the original okay. description was having two selectors in a service, one Got being it. the primary, the other being the, oh crap, selector. <laughs> Okay. And to be clear for health checks here, we're talking about the kubelet health checks, not lid balancer health checks. That's right. Okay. Um, and so I, I thought it was an, it's an interesting idea. I've heard it enough times now that I'm open to considering it, but the real question is, do we pound this into the service API or do we say, actually, here's another great use case where gateway might be the better vehicle? Help me with that one a little bit, just so I'm, I'm clear on what you think. Um, if we had a service in, we have uh, like a TCP route, right? Um, what if the TCP route was the place where we put the backup selector in? Like service is just such an overloaded API that everything we add to it comes with a hundred corner cases. If you look at the test matrix that's in um, the registry tests for service, like Every new dimension we add adds thousands of lines of test case because it has to be tested against all the other combinations. So um, possibly this would be make more sense in like a TCP route instead of instead of in service. I mean, a TCP route is basically a service VIP, right? Like, yeah, if you it does. It. That does kind of put the uh, the onus on. Whoever, like this guy, for instance, if he's got his uh, Gunicorn uh, front end and his Python back end, right? Like he said in the situation, service type load balancer exposing it or something like that. That then means they have to put something else that speaks gateway API in between it. So it doesn't serve the case where you wouldn't necessarily want like an ingress controller in front of it. Um, that'd be my, my only worry, I guess, is that... If, if we... I would love to see us as a project get to a place where service, the role that service fills was minimized and minimized and minimized, right? And so uh, if they wanted to create a cluster IP, we could have a cluster IP gateway. Gateway cl class equals cluster IP, right? And then in the TCP route for that, you could have your backup service. Instead of jamming it into service, uh, sorry, backup selector. Instead of jamming it into the service API itself, um, the the conversation digressed a little bit into this idea of, like, do we derive a new API resource from service that is just a selector, like a standing query? Um, but I, it's a it's a lot of ideation without a lot of follow through right now. Cal, I saw your hand go up, and then I think it went down. What, what do you want so to say? I, I was pretty much going to say the same. My, my fear is you overload service with stuff that are up, layer up and not layer down. A service is a service that does one thing and it does it really well. Uh, and today, people Cal do the, the same exact had, Cal and Antonio are the people who had to review those thousands and thousands of lines of test cases. So if anybody's familiar with what it means to add a new dimension on service, it's those two. Yeah. And it's also, it's also like one of those things, it's, it's like putting a user space thing into a kernel module, like why should we do that? It should be on a up layer, like one layer above, not one layer below. And, and to be honest, not everybody would do that. So a gateway sounds to me like a perfect place for this, right? Uh, I should say that not, on, first, on first consideration, I agree, like that does seem like a compelling feature. Yeah. We do, we do, I do feel like lately, and, and in the same way that we worry about overloading service, I do feel like lately we say that should go to gateway a lot, and that does give me some pause sometimes. Um, I, I, this, as the person who's throwing the fire hose at you guys, um, I, I feel that, 
Um, but Gateway is already designed to be, this is my internal excuse. Gateway is already designed to be a modular API with multiple extensions and extension points. So adding something to Gateway doesn't mean slamming another field into the same resource. It means building out the constellation of resources with different flavors. And, and so in that regard, it feels less terrible than trying to jam it into service, which you know, service represents like a cluster IP and a node port and a backend selector and a port mapping and protocol selection and external DNS. And like, there's just too many concepts in one API. I'm with you. Uh, go ahead first, Antonio, and then I have something to say. Yeah, that's just now that we are in this conversation because I talked it with Rob the other day, and and I like to to bring this up. So now TCP route and, and gateway has services only as backend. If we move in this direction, which is going to be the backend? This yeah. magic selector, the IP addresses. <laughs> deployments and staple set. So I've seen a couple I've seen a couple of cases where people are trying to build an API that looks a whole lot like service. Like it's a selector with a port and um but they don't want to use service or they try to use service, but service is so overloaded they have to then say, well what if the user makes it a headless service? What if they make it a load balancer service? What if it's a node port? What if they set external name and then point your thing to this? Like none of those things make sense in those contexts. And so what people are, I, I've seen a couple times, not, not a lot, but a couple, um, where what they really just want is a selector that generates endpoints. And they don't want to write that logic themselves because it's complicated logic, right? This is part of the discussion of, of externalizing the endpoint slice controller, right? And like using that as a library. Um, but the other direction would be, what if we just had a resource that was a pod selector that generated endpoint slices and like the same way when you, you know, Antonio, the work with IP address, right? You create a service and you get an IP address. What if you created a service and you get a pod selector and the pod selector is the thing that actually triggers the endpoint generation? Like, does that make sense? I don't know. Uh, one quick question is, you always talk about pod. Is, have you identified that all these people is, is pod the resource that we want or do we, Want something that orchestrate pods like the project? You mean like a deployment selector or something? No, what I'm saying is uh, uh, we have to forward traffic to something. And when it seems that you have the use cases and it's clear from your comments that this people is focused on pods. Pod is the the end object, the backend. And and what I'm asking is is that the right backend or we should move people to work with deployments, staple sets, and all these things that already orchestrate pods. I don't know. Um, at some point in the fairly distant past, um, Minhan and I discussed abstracting pod into like a workload selector. So you could register a VM into your cluster and then have a service target your VM. Um, felt clever, but it also didn't feel justified. This was, I don't know, three years ago, probably. So, so Antonio, do you mean to make a, say that the endpoints can be pretty, pretty much anything, or are you looking at things like service chaining? Or sort of where, where are you trying to go? I'm just curious. No, I don't know. I just, you know, I like to, to hear a, the use cases and and think about how people solve them. So I was wondering if we are saying pot here because it's the thing that we always use, or if the people may is, uh, want something like workflow or a group of pods or you know, something like that. I'm just uh, asking. <laughs> So I don't today, have anything in mind. Today we're looking at, I mean, sort of layer four, I guess you can see, say, and something that will terminate the layer four connection. That, that's what the service does today, right? But um, it's, we are hitting uh, the half hour on this. Uh, yeah, we, we should push forward. Um, the discussion I, on this issue mostly moved on to the, the linked issue of backup selectors. So if people want to keep the conversation going, that's where it seems to be right now. 
Okay. But yes, I think we can triage accept this one and move forward. Or, or rather, the I guess the question is, should we just dedupe it to backup selector? That's, I think the question, and this is what I was going to say is, I, I think the, the concept that we might be able to put like some fallback routing behavior into uh, gateway API makes sense. But I think there are two questions we need to ask this person. One of them is if that interpretation of backup selector is actually accurate to what they want, because it's not clear to me 100% that it is. We should just verify that. Um, and then see if something like putting that in gateway API would be tenable. So those two questions before we accept it, maybe would be something to, or, or dedupe it would be good. I could do that. I could just assign myself this and do that if that sounds right to everybody. Go for it. Okay. And then one, we can move one on. random question though, like for backup selector, are they just like unicorn pods that are the backups that are, I don't know, special somehow or like why doesn't just scaling your normal service or auto scaling handle this that's a fair question um when i first saw the backup selector discussion that was my thought was why don't you just scale out instead of having a backup selector and the thing that came to i came to realize was the backup selector is not a replacement for the service, like it's doing the service's job. It's just something that says, oh no, oh my mm. God, something's happening. Like load shed, load shed, return errors, be super Is that cheap. Like the fail whale service kind of thing? Yeah, yes. I mean, okay. in a lot of the ingress implementations, we have the default 404 server, right? Like if you mm. if you didn't, if you didn't, if you gave us a, if your ingress controller a URL that it didn't understand, it would just send you to the 404 server. Got and it. all the 404 server would do is return 404. Okay, that and makes so more it's sense. Super lightweight, and it can serve hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of QPS. Thanks. Okay. Thank you all. I think I just realized this one's actually assigned, and I didn't realize that before. So maybe we don't need to stop and look at this one. There's an ongoing conversation here. Okay. Rob's got that. Unless somebody wants to stop and look at that one. I, I figured, should we normally say hey, if it's assigned and somebody is like triaging it, we should probably just move on unless somebody yeah. specifically brings it up. Same with this one. Uh, allowing overridable DNS options for cluster first and cluster first with hostnet policy in the kubelet configuration. Let's see if anybody's looked at this one. Antonio. Uh, I looked you... at it. Antonio, did you look at it? Yeah, that's, uh, we talked a lot about this. It's, we don't have a DNS cluster configuration. And right that's now right. It's, it's, it's Kubelet flag. And the, the, the kudos to the person that really explained it. I mean, it's a good description. It, this so has come up. A... It, it has come up before. Uh, the answer that we've given before was you know, we have uh, Gatekeeper and OPA and things like that. You can just go and implement a cluster default on your own through that. It's not a great answer, but it is an answer. Yeah, the thing is, I, I, we have this issue with the service side and all the thing is, what is configuration? What is uh, installation? What is and we have the service side, cluster side, DNS config, um, since that we are moving towards make it yeah, I mean, in, in the limit, everything that we pass as a flag to any component could eventually become an API resource. Like that is the right. path that we're on, right? But DNS is a scare, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't be changing all the DNS configuration through an API in all the nodes in a cluster that you know may have different resolvers or whatever. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not 100% against this idea, but I think the logical conclusion is we write a new API resource and we let pods, you, like we do storage class, you set one of them as the default. And then when pods are started, they look at which DNS policy they're supposed to choose. And then the kubelet watches those and then actuates the policy on the pods as it starts up. And then we will have the discussion about setting different defaults per namespace. And then, you know, like we can do it. I'm just not sure that it's the best return on our investment right now when we've got so many other irons in the fire. I, I don't know if he's asking just for the kubelet. And 
Is there more to it than that? I, I interpreted it to be just configure my pods DNS config for me. Yeah, but uh, I, there is more. In... So the, the, he, he ended, uh, I asked it because it was fake and he, and I think that what he wants is in the Kimlet config to add the option to configure DNS, this DNS option. Without, without, if I'm if I'm reading this right and hearing this right, without um, more information from him about what problems this is causing, this seems like it's just something that's inconvenient. And so this is kind of in the nice to have uh, territory. Agree. Yeah. So, is it the is it the kind of situation where we should accept it and then put it on like priority backlog if somebody wants to get to it eventually they can. The, the other thing is, is there any precedent that we touched the Kubelet config team? You may know. Because that used to be signal territory. Yeah, I really, I don't, I don't think sticking it in Kubelet config is a good answer. Like, I feel like we should, you know, go all the way or don't do it at all. Go big ah, or go home. I agree. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. Is there somebody that wants to kind of carry this I'll forward? Respond. And... Okay. I'll respond to this one. You can assign it to me. Um, I, I'll actually, I'll just edit my answer um, a little bit and uh, recap what we talked about. And I'll accept it, which will force us to look at it again in a few months because nobody's going to work on it in the meantime. That's my prediction. Roger that. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, this one I haven't seen at all. Failure cluster, test node, IPAM controller with setting mask. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah, uh, he's sending a fix and uh, for 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 that. Right. And, uh, the test is failing. No, it's it's timing out the test. Yeah. But. During the test refactor, he found out that we were doing K log fatal directory in the controller. And I was commenting with Jordan, and Jordan said, uh, It's better that you don't do that. Uh, do it properly and propagate the error so it fails. And, but, well, you can assign it to, to Paco. Okay. So sign it right back to him. Yeah. He's, he's, he has to fix it. I'll do that uh, async right after. All right, let's go. OK, so actually, we only have one more thing. Um, Bridget, we do have the time. So if you'd like, we can look at some of the frozen stuff. Fantastic. This is just a repeat from last time, but I thought, hey, we made some progress on those in the past. Why not look at some of the exciting old ones again? Roger that. Do you want to just go to oldest first? Somebody call one out that they really want to just look right at this one. Sure, why not? Yeah, why not? 2017, a good year, a good vintage. <laughs> Kublet will, is, uh, go ahead. Th yeah, this is Dan Quincy, Carl, and team. They are the experts of this. Thing. Oh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the, so. I mean, what, what do I say here? Yeah, like there's really no consensus about why external IP even exists. Like, Kubelet does not internally ever look at, ever care about multiple node IP addresses and, and internal IP versus external IP. So it's all external tooling and so one argument is, oh yeah, we need to add the ability to have external IPs on bare metal nodes so that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then the other argument is, well, you know, we lasted this long without it. Maybe people can just configure that through some other means. And yet nobody ever really makes a strong argument either way. Okay. But there was another issue with this that you cannot patch or something. This this thing that you know, the key, you the way that. 
You can't what? You cannot patch or you patch something. It, uh, you no, all, all the problems with patching. Well, I mean, you, you, you can't patch the addresses because people will just overwrite them, but that's... that's ah, uh, I was to overwrite. Okay, I was missing too. So if right. you set manually, it, it will get, get overwritten by... Well, and that's because it gets the external IPs from the cloud provider stuff that it runs internally, right? Right. But on bare metal, you don't have that. Correct. I mean, you could but it will a... still overwrite them periodically with right. a single right. node IP that you gave it at startup. Well, I'm saying is like you could write a bare metal kubelet provider connector or something like that that gets them from somewhere else as opposed to kubelet arguments. I don't know. You can imagine a situation where you create a CRD that specifies your bare metal external IPs, and then Kubelet will pull them from that through that, that connector as opposed the, to... The, the question is not, how do we do this? We could we yeah. can easily add API to do okay. this. The question it's is, do why? we want to do it? And, and we've never been able to answer that question. Well, it will be fine with the 24 combinations that we have in your test. <laughs> Um, well, maybe a different question is what actually cares about external IPs that Kubelet writes there anyway? Nothing in tree. So it kind of sounds like we would really need to see somebody from the outside pressing us for this um, right. for us to actually work on it. So maybe it is, I mean, I don't know. I've, I've said this before. I feel like closed does not mean dead forever but I don't know how everybody else feels about that necessarily. So maybe it's fair to close it. It's not something we're prioritizing at all, but that doesn't mean that somebody couldn't come along later and we reopen it if we need to, because they want to push for it. With the caveat that close kind of is not a place where people necessarily will look. So we could end up with somebody who cares in the future, opening something that we can't merge with it later. Yeah, that's something Tim brought up last time too, which is why I'm not trying to be too pushy about it. Like uh, close, people don't usually search through closed. I tend to, but... Uh, I would say it's probably accurate. The vast majority of people don't. So duplicates, if nothing else. Um, but the alternative, I guess, is that it's open forever without anybody working on it, which is that worse than somebody creating a new one that when they want it? I would say as long as we have a label saying that this one is in the icebox or whatever, that's Actually, functionally equivalent and keeps the history. Assign it to me because I need to revisit the cloud node IP kept in the next cycle anyway, because as I started implementing it, it yet again turned out to be more complicated than we had thought. So so I, I would say leave, leave it open and assign it to me. Well, Dan, I remember that I, I have a way to test it. I, I requested a, a yeah, repo so. in, in Kubernetes and, and I'm going to make it part of kind. So we are going to have CI on your chain. So when you have something, we need to, to have it test. Right. And don't be afraid, Dan, if you decide ultimately, like, even if it's real, we're not going to do it anytime soon, go ahead and close it. Don't be too shy. That's kind of how I feel about it. Next one is Kubelet and Kube Proxy fail to reload certificates when they are updated. This one's ringing a bell for me. Another 2017. And the last person to say anything on it. I'm not sure if any of them are here. Jay said something on it in 2021. George Angel said something on it last August. They have a workaround. OK. Uh, Ooh, any work around that involves we restart daily that solves it i'm just like solves needs a big asterisk <laughs> yeah i mean it does work solve a lot of, it solves a lot of problems right <laughs> it solves a lot of memory leaks i'm gonna tell you that <laughs> like very seriously a lot of systems get by on that that band-aid until somebody insists on code freeze for like retail holiday and then everything blows up on cyber monday not that that's ever happened to me while i've been on call several jobs back. 
All righty. So this is on I both don't... of us. We should potentially we should split this out, right? So that there's one for kubelet and one for kube proxy. Um, but it sounds like this is still a thing. Like this is. I mean, if I understand correctly, this is about the TLS certificates, right? Mm -hmm. And like, it sounds like any application that serves HTTP with a TLS certificate has this problem. It's not a kubelet or kube proxy thing. It's a mm -hmm. applications don't generally go back and reload their HTTP certificate, or rather that's not a default feature of like Go's HTTP stack. So this this is about client search though for Kubelet and proxy talking to the API server. Right. I don't think it's about Kubelet oh. doing its own TLS serving for its endpoint. Right. Yeah. This is the so they had to update the cert for the API server. Kubelet and Kube proxy are not trying to do anything about that and therefore fail. I mean, your uh, what you said, Tim, uh. is valid as well. <laughs> But Kubelet has a uh, rotating team. Does the API server handle this correctly? Yeah, Kubelet has a uh, rotating certificate. So it sends the connection when it, 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 it has something that flows the connection, renew the certificates and, and enroll it back. For its client certificate to the API server or for its own TLS service endpoint? Oh, uh, 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 okay. Um, yeah, okay. that's the part I don't understand because early in the bug it says TLS client. Oh, it says TLS client certificate. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I saw TLS and I skipped the word client. I mean, but both of those things are valid. And, you know, I guess the first question I'd ask is does the ah, API server the correctly handle its server cert and or CA being swapped out underneath it at runtime? Yeah. Because I, no I, I think you're right, Tim, that. You know, if even if it did support that, then every other component in the cluster also need that talks to the API server would need to support it, not just Kubelet and Kube proxy. Uh, which certificate is this? <laughs> this one that need to be run on. You know that, that uh, well, one that the, the important one certificate. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, what is configured? Is the one that is in the Kube config in the config map? It's unclear to me from reading this which certificate or certificates it is talking about. Well, it, the okay. first comment in the top of the issue seems pretty clear under, if you go all the way up, uh, go a little bit right there, under what happened. So it says TLS certs were updated properly, but Kubelet and Kube proxy keep the old certs in memory. This causes them to fail when communicating with API server. Oh. Right. Okay. And I also say, yeah, TLS clients. Do, do, do we have time for another topic? Sir, let's wrap this one. Does, does anybody want to like look into it? It's actually kind of an interesting problem uh, in general. I don't think it's necessarily specific to cube proxy or kubelet. Um, it is interesting. It doesn't seem like it's on fire, but if somebody wanted to, like if somebody was interested in this area and wanted to take it as a background task, that would be good. I, the other thing is, it's probably simpler than the other way that you were thinking of, Tim, because if you're a server and you need to update your certificate, I mean, I guess you can close all your client connections and make them all reconnect. But I think in this case, it might be slightly less complicated. Right. For Kubelet, for it has something that cuts the client connect. It has a, it has a, a dialer cache. And when it has to renew, it closes all the client connections and it calls to reconnect from the client side. Yeah, I mean, we could do this like we did with, uh, was it Kube proxy? Like, well, your config has changed, OS exit, and let the, let the controller restart <laughs> <actually start. laughs> it. That's, that's always fun. I, it's not actually a bad answer, like just wrapping it in a watch of the file and say, oh, the, your certificate has changed. I, I'm going to just go ahead and nuke the process. That kind of makes it sound like we actually do have something that's supposed to take care of this already. Did I misunderstand you? Uh, we have that for something else. I forget, Antonio. What was? Do you remember what it was that we were doing that for? 
in in which team? In Cube Proxy. Yeah. Didn't we end up doing that in Cube Proxy? It was the I notify team, right? Yeah, but what was it? I know. Oh, is it, it was its own config file. Right. Yeah. So it's the, the, it's the same that... loop. Like, if you consider the the cube proxy or any application as a function of its inputs, if its input changes, you need to restart the function, right? So, one of the inputs but here is a TLS certificate. The problem with I notify was that they was a, a move, right, or something like that that they didn't detect as a change. Yeah, I mean, I notify is imperfect, but we could go back and the big hammer would be just do the same thing, right? Here's a list of files. We'll watch them. Anytime we detect a change in them, we just nuke the whole process. And yes, Tim, it's clumsy. This is in queue proxy. It does return error and exit. So you're yeah, no, I, I remember deciding that that was mm. the better answer than trying to actually handle it elegantly. Okay, so maybe that's worth a comment. Sure, I'll throw a comment in there. All right, cool. Thank you. And should I unfreeze it? Or is that the goal of this discussion, right? Is to unfreeze these issues? That is the, yeah, that was the the, the goal Bridget was thinking that. It, yeah, I mean, we just would to try. move their life cycle along. Either we are working on this or we're not working on this, but it'd be great if we haven't forgotten something for five years and just left it languishing, you know. Okay. I'll unfreeze it and we'll see if anybody wants to take it up. Roger that. Antonio, you want to, can you post the cubelet part into the bug? Yes. Um, Antonio, it sounded like maybe you had one other topic you wanted to kind of uh, bring in real quick before we. Yeah, because I have a thing, and this is a conversation with 150 comments in Slack about the, you know that we have now a cluster cider API that configures the iPhone and the post side that's on the node. And what I'm trying to do is to create the same but for service, a service side. But as Carl correctly pointed out, is we are going to allow people to have overlapping between cluster cider and service cider. So we need to have a way to to avoid that. We right now are doing that because we are passing both parameters as a flag, and there is only one node IPAN controller, and the node IPAN controller checks the flags and, and removes one node. There. So what uh, I was thinking is if we have a service either, we can add a, a status condition, and the node IPAN cider will be the one to populate this condition to say uh, you can use it without overlapping or, or not. <laughs> okay, I think that is not a good idea. I, I'm just thinking, uh, I'm trying to page back there in. There is no way we can come to a conclusion in eight minutes on this. Like, if yeah, you but did, then. <laughs> there are eight minutes. I want to, I mean, I mean the other day, uh, for example, Lars didn't know about the cluster side side the API. So I think that. At least it's good to talk here to so more people. To be honest, uh, Antonio, the the way we solve situations like gnarly situations like this before is to huddle, get a group of people who are interested on this exact topic, right? Only this, nothing else, and get them in a separate meeting, sit down, these are the proposal, these are the solution, and just act on it. We've but done this, if I remember, with services. Yeah, but I, I commented this with uh, other people that is not in Edward and, and so with David Eats and, and, and I think that they run. Well, anyway, and he told me that the canonical way to solve this problem is, is with status conditions and controller populating the condition. I mean, uh, I just wanted to be, to, to raise it if it's a, uh, a quick win, or mm, I have doubt we should think more. So about we have it. two. We have two different resources that describe fundamentally drawing from the same space, and we first we have to define like what do we what do we think we want the semantic to be? Like, 
historically it's the service ranges win, right? But that was only because uh, we could do it at startup time, right? Like what happens now that this is all asynchronous to each other? What if I'm create a service range that overlaps an existing nodes CIDR range? Like it's already in use. Like we can't take it back from the node, right? So it can't, the heuristic can't be simply services win. So we, yeah, need to like, our, we need to figure out the logic tree. Also, no, but the, the thing, the thing is, the use case is people run a, uh, wants to have one or two problems. So this initially was because IPv6 didn't support more than one hundred twenty-two. But the use case is people have the services have code and doesn't have any way to ring or to or to grow. I mean, it cannot resize the service side directly. That's that's the, the what we added in the case. So I think that that the service here is the the one that is not uh, ruling the. I mean, the feature is just to be able to add more or less IPs to the service branch. I think that cluster side has preference. Is this um all in that Slack? conversation you were talking about or is there a relevant issue no oh, there is this is a cap that is started that i started in 2019 i think <laughs> are we going to reconvene a smaller group then yeah, we're getting close to the top of the hour here, so we probably should just flatly follow up on this. I commented on what, sorry. I no, commented no, no, no. On, on an old uh, issue in the chat channel. I don't know if I have misunderstood it completely, but it seems to be solved. Uh, oh, you have a new one. Um, but service doesn't support match expressions. Deployment does, but service doesn't. Those things I have tested, they work. Which things? Uh, the match expressions. So you can have a group if you want to have uh, um, Match sure, but this is this is specified in the deployment. If you uh, turn that into a service, the service selector field is the old, old, old style of map of string to string. Uh, so it okay. only supports so, match match labels. Okay, so I misunderstood it. The the question with that with this issue is can we backfill the service API with a modern selector? Um, without breaking anybody. Um, and I don't think we've done the homework to try to figure out if we can ballet dance our way through the field of lasers that are shooting at us. <laughs> okay. It's sort okay. of the same question as the all ports question of like, we're sort of hemmed in by past API decisions superficially we can't change past api decisions but actually in practice if we do the right you know pirouettes at the right time we can avoid the lasers it just is a lot of work if somebody wants to undertake it we can talk about it roger that we are hitting the top of the hour uh lars if you're still interested in talking about this one please do feel free to put it on the agenda for next time or just bring it up in slack and we can continue the conversation All right. So I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone. Until next time. Thanks, everyone. So much for a light agenda. <laughs>